Luke chapter 9, 46 through 48. Then his disciples began arguing about which of them was the greatest. But Jesus knew their thoughts, so he brought a little child to his side. Then he said to them, Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Pray with me, please. Holy God, touch our hearts this day. May your spirit move. May it all bring you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to test y'all's memory here a little bit. Kenny Rogers had a song some years back. It's called I Am the Greatest. Uh, here's, I'm, going to, I'm, going to read, I'm not going to sing it, y'all. I'm not going to be disappointed. Aww. Yeah. All right. I'm going to, little boy in a baseball hat stands in the field with his ball and bat. Says, I am the greatest player of them all. Puts his bat on his shoulder and he tosses up his ball. And the ball goes up and the ball comes down. Swings his bat all the way around. The world's so still you can hear the sound. The baseball falls to the ground. Now the little boy doesn't say a word. Picks up his ball. He is undeterred. Says, I am the greatest that there has ever been. And he grits his teeth and he tries again. And the ball goes up and the ball comes down. Swings his bat all the way around. The world's so still you can hear the sound. The baseball falls to the ground. He makes no excuses. He shows no fear. He just closes his eyes and listens to the cheers. Little boy, he adjusts his hat, picks up his ball, stares at his bat. Says, I am the greatest when the game is on the line. And he gives it his all one last time. And the ball goes up, and the moon so bright, swings his bat with all his might. The world's as still as still can be. The baseball falls, and that's strike three. Now it's supper time, and his mom calls. Little boy starts home with his bat and ball. Says, I am the greatest, that is a fact, but even I didn't know I could pitch like that. <laughs> Says, I am the greatest, that is understood, but even I didn't know I could pitch that good. <laughs> well, maybe so, maybe so. Uh, you know, I kind of wonder where, maybe the disciples were in some kind of mindset like that, you know, I don't know. But it's, it's funny that uh, Jesus had just got through telling them, I'm going to give up my life. The Son of Man is going to be handed over and is going to suffer and die. And they didn't get it. They didn't hear Him. And they, they start arguing among themselves about <laughs> who's going to be the greatest among them. Wow. It's the world view, Matthew. Uno mas. Yeah. This is a world view. And this is where the disciples were. They had a world view. They, they believed, even, even after Jesus keeps telling them, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, it's gonna cost me my life. This thing. They 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 keep thinking he's gonna establish an earthly kingdom. And they're going to be his lieutenants, you know, in one form or another. And which one of them is going to be his right-hand man, you know, that sort of thing. They're still still arguing about it. But it's, a, you know, it's common to all of us, y'all. It's been around for a long time, this, this, this worldview, you know, back at the time of Moses, old Pharaoh said, I'm the greatest. I, I, I rule the world. I'm in charge. And he had, he had his own world view of, of, of power. And it's, it's been, and you know, even uh, 
centuries later when the Israelites had, had gone to the promised land and all that and, and, and they're living there and they looked around and they saw all the other kingdoms had a king and they didn't have one. And they're like, why don't we have a king? We want a king too. So they, they, they got that worldview, we want an earthly king. We want, and, and, and God gave them one. He gave them Saul, who looked the part. I mean, he was big and tall and, and handsome, and he looked like a king so that they would be happy that they got their worldview satisfied. But it didn't quite work out that way. And if we're not careful, y'all, we can, we can do the same thing in our day. We can look for world leaders. We can look for, for people to lead us that are smart, you know, that have power, have prestige, have personality, pizzazz, have, you know, all the, the it factor, you know. If we're not careful, we can get caught up in it. We, too, can have that worldview and not be too concerned about what's in a person's heart. Matthew. <clears throat> well, let's look at a child's view. This scripture talks about a child. What does it say? Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf, on my behalf welcomes me. What about a child? What about a little child? And it's, it's a little child. It's a, it's a pre-puberty child. You know, somewhere, you know, less than 12 years old. Well, they're powerless, right? They have no power. They don't bring anything to the table. They have no riches. They're still growing and learning. They're still impressionable. They're still moldable. They, they, they take things on faith, right? If you love them and, 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 and pour yourself into them, they will follow you. They will trust you, right? That they trust unquestioningly. And Jesus also, they're humble. They're humble. And, and they, they can be taught. They can be led. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 3 and 4, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Becoming like a child, Matthew talks about. Having that heart of a child being that kind of Christ follower that we're, 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 we allow ourselves to, to follow completely by faith, trusting in God, Matthew 1. Uh, there's a heavenly view also in this. If you'll recall, we talk, I mentioned a, a minute ago about uh, Pharaoh back in the time of <laughs> Moses. And you'll remember Moses, right? He was born at a time when the Hebrew people were forced to get rid of their male children. Remember that? <coughs> right? And, and, and this powerless, powerless baby, powerless infant, at three months of age, was put in a, in a basket and floated in the Nile River. <coughs> this child, who would deliver the children of Israel from bondage, slavery to Pharaoh, who would break down the, the kingdom of Pharaoh, this child who God would use to defeat Pharaoh's army, the powerless one. Do you see? God used this three-month-old infant to bring down a kingdom and to set his people free. Samuel's mother, you remember Samuel's mom went to the well before she gave birth, she was, she was barren, and she went 
year after year, and she said, Lord, if you will give me a child, I will dedicate him to you. And so the Lord heard her prayers. And, and she became with child, and, and she, once she got that kid <coughs> weaned and all that, she brought him and she gave him to the priest. And the priest raised Samuel there in the house of the Lord. And that that child would become a prophet of Israel. And he would go, he would go to the house of Jesse looking for a king because God sent this prophet to go to Jesse's house. And there he, all the, all the, all the powerful sons of, of Jesse came marching before him and the Lord said, no, no, that's not the one. And, and, and Sam was like, surely this is what the one, because look at how he looks. And the Lord says, uh-uh. I look at the heart. And when that all processed by, Samuel said, is that it? Don't you have another son? <coughs> and Jesse's like, well, <laughs> yeah, I got little David. He's out there <laughs> watching the sheep. Send for him. And this one who his family had thought was worth nothing more than to tend the sheep in the pasture, God had anointed him king and had raised him up to fight lions and bears and beat them with their, his bare hands. And when he came forward, God said, that's the one, anoint him as my king. And so Samuel anointed David, the powerless one, king. There's another one. <laughs> There's a child that was born seemingly to an unwed mother. in a cattle stall in a nowhereville town there in Israel called Bethlehem. And he was placed in a feed trough. Huh. Powerless. Through these powerless ones, God showed his might. And he, he raised him up because it was his own son. And on him rested all power. God has always chosen to work in surprising ways through the powerless to show the might of his power and to bring glory to his name. There's a, there, in this passage of scripture where it says, uh, anyone who welcomes a little child... The, the word in Greek is for welcome is dekatai, which, which means there's a benefit that is given with the initiative on the part of the one giving it, but the emphasis is on the one receiving it. I mean, this is, that's a little complicated, right? Okay. Somebody's receiving a benefit it's given. There's, it takes initiative to do it. There's an initiative in the one who's giving it, but the emphasis is not on the one giving the gift. It's on the one receiving it. So that if I'm, if I'm welcoming a child in the name of Christ, I don't strut around and say, look at me. Look at what I'm doing for, for that child, for these children. The emphasis is on the kid. And they're the ones that are exalted. Make sense? Also in this, um, this passage, it's, 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 uh, Jesus is saying, 
this little child, he's saying this to the disciples, this little child, this powerless one, is greater than all of you. Greater than all of you because this child comes in faith, trusting in me to lead him. Not looking out for old number one, not trying to exalt themselves. This child is, is out to follow me where I want him to go. Matthew, would you? This is a picture of from eight years ago. <clears throat> Justin, do you recognize that? <laughs> Forbidden City. It's in Beijing. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the lady there with Caleb and I, that was eight years ago, was my wife, Judy. This was in August. What we didn't know is that a uh, cancer bomb had already gone off in her. And as we went over there to get Lucy, which uh, we would get her in just a few days, and hadn't, hadn't gotten her yet. Uh, we had all kinds of plans and dreams, y'all. I was about to finish seminary. Judy was about to start seminary. Uh, in a few months, we would be coming to this town to be associate pastors at First Methodist Church. Both of us, uh, you know, we 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 had a we had a plan. You know, what we didn't know, we didn't know that she was dying. Our plan, our hopes, our dreams. Matthew, would you go to the next one? This would be, within two years, this would be the family. This would be it. Less than two years later, Judy would pass away, uh, leaving the three of us. This powerless kid. That God had us go get, all right? I mean, God had us go get it. Get her. Uh, <laughs> Matthew, go to the next slide. Please. Do you see God's plan? God knew long before we ever left to go to China to get Lucy, that Judy was, wasn't going to make it. I didn't know that. God knew. Now, I'm not saying he caused it or it was his will or any of that stuff, but I'm saying he had a plan already in place to redeem us, to, to help us, to bless us and, and to put us on, on 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 a track. I didn't see it coming. I didn't know any Asian people, you know, at the time. Didn't know any. Now some of my closest friends are. All right, there's Justin from from Beijing, y'all. I couldn't have done that. And God, while we were in China with getting Lucy, uh, y'all, I'd gone to the prison in Livingston countless times as a volunteer and, and, and beat my head against the wall a thousand times. And God just says, here, I want you to lead this guy to me. Uh, just a just a happenstance meeting. I didn't even intend to meet that guy, this atheist professor in Changsha, and and God brings him to my hotel, and he invites us to dinner, and, and huh? And there at the dinner table, 
I asked him what he thought about Christianity, and he said, oh, I think it's a great religion. But he's like, I'm an atheist, and I believe in the Big Bang Theory and evolution. Huh? <laughs> oh, man. Really? I was like, okay, Lord, I can't do this. And I just say, well, you know what? I believe that God made the heavens and the earth, and then we blew it. We fell in the garden, and because of that, he had to send his son into this world to pay the price for our sins. And I looked at him, and he was like, his lip was quivering. I'm like, uh, really? Like, Dr. God, do you, would you, you think one day you might want to invite Christ to be Lord of your life? And he's like, yes, I do. Well, would you like to do it right now? Yes, I would. God, really? <laughs> the powerless. Matthew, go Just scroll through. This is your BFF, kids. This is the ministry of this church. You have 50-something kids coming to your church every afternoon, Monday through Friday. There's a ministry on Wednesday for them. I'm going to go out on a limb here, y'all. That's the most important ministry this church has. We need to love these children. We need to love them well and point them toward Jesus Christ. Now, I know everybody can't be here from 3.30 to 5 o'clock on Wednesday. You know what? There's other ways you can minister to them. You can come meet their parents after 5 o'clock. Meet and greet them. You can, we can, I can give you names and addresses. You, you can pray for them. You can send notes to their house. Say, you know, I'm praying for your child. Or send them to the child. I'm praying for you this week. You know, this is your ministry. You know, we can look over these kids' head and say, I wonder what the Lord's wanting us to do. What can we do out yonder? But we're looking over these kids' head to do it. This is your ministry. This is it. If we don't do that well, then the onus is on us. It takes the initiative on our part to touch these kids. They're sitting in our lap. What are we going to do with it? It's up to you. Maybe Kenny Rogers was on to something, y'all. Maybe Kenny Rogers was on to something. God has got a special place in his heart for children. Certainly the childlike in faith, but, but Luke doesn't take the same approach that Matthew does. Luke says children, a little child. Let me read that again. <coughs> Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me also welcomes my Father who sent me. Whoever is the least among you is the greatest. Find a way 
the, the, the challenge is for us to find a way to love these kids, to love them well, to point them toward Jesus Christ. Can we do that? Can I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's try and work and find ways to, to touch these kids and their families. Because I believe that's where God wants us to focus our attention. We've got other stuff we need to be doing too, right? For sure. But this is, we need to do this the best. We need to give them the best of ourselves and pull them toward Christ. And God will, if we're welcoming them, we're welcoming Christ, okay? All right. Enough said. <laughs> All right, y'all. Kenny was on to something. Yeah, these kids mess up. They make mistakes. They're not perfect. But you know what? In Christ's eyes, they're the greatest. Amen. If you're here today and you don't.